First up is Ghostbusters Afterlife. It is directed by Jason Reitman, who is the son of Ivan Reitman, the director of the original Ghostbusters film. I'm a huge fan of the original Ghostbusters film, and I'm actually someone who enjoyed the recent reboot that had the female Ghostbusters, but this film takes place in the same universe as the original series. It stars Paul Rudd, Finn Wolfhard, Carrie Coon, McKenna Grace, Celeste O'Connor, and a whole lot of people from the original film. And I gotta say, so this movie is definitely meant for people who are fans of the original Ghostbusters. I feel like it sometimes gets a little caught up too much in its own nostalgia. Like, I don't know if you came into this cold as your first experience with Ghostbusters that you would get a lot of enjoyment out of it. I think you'd be able to follow the story and I think there are moments that are there. I think the fact that Paul Rudd is in it and he's very much playing a Paul Rudd-esque character, you know, that's that's accessible to a lot of people. So many of the jokes are definitely accessible, but the film definitely relies on having an existing knowledge of the events that transpired in the first film and obviously there was Ghostbusters too, but really this is not trying to reinvent the wheel and I think it's fine, you know, I think there are so many people who are such huge fans of Ghostbusters that they are going to enjoy this, but I, you know, I was hoping for something a little bit more out of it. Instead of a recycling of things that we have seen before, it's very much working out some daddy issues, which, you know, I, I get it, the son is the director and sits in the shadow of his father who is this legendary director in Hollywood, like he's working some of that out on the screen, that's fine. I think the performances are good, Paul Rudd as always is just super watchable and he's not not really stretching far with this role. I think Finn Wolfhard is is fine as a teenager. Carrie Coon does a really good job, but McKenna Grace is really the star of the show here. And I, I have to recommend a film she's in called Troop Zero. It's on Amazon Prime, I think. She just does a really good job as this very science-oriented young woman. I think the film also gets really caught up in playing tribute to Harold Ramis, which, you know, I think is a an admirable thing, but I, I as well as dealing with its sort of daddy issues, I think it gets very caught up in those moments. And I think there are ways that they could have dialed that back just a little bit. So if you are a super fan of the Ghostbusters franchise, I think you are going to enjoy this. Like it's it's not going to be anything revolutionary, but you're going to have a good time. Really, what it made me want to do is rewatch the original Ghostbusters. Like that that's what I got out of it. And I, I wonder if I would have just gotten the same satisfaction if I'd popped in Ghostbusters again and didn't need to watch this one. But whatever, we'll, we'll never know because now I've watched this one. I think if you are not interested in the franchise or, you know, weren't familiar with it or whatever it may be, just watch the original Ghostbusters. Like just do that you'll be fine it'll be great uh, you know some of the stuff maybe won't hold up quite as much but I also don't think some of the stuff in this film is going to hold up quite as much in terms of some of the cultural references like there's a whole character called podcast who just walks around podcasting and I'm like in 20 to 30 years will this make sense who knows maybe probably but it, it definitely feels like a moment in time if you were someone who is not at all interested in the Ghostbusters franchise you're just not into it at all this is obviously not going to be for you because it, it's so so dedicated to trying almost too hard to be in the vein of the original film but it's not willing to break away enough from that first formula in order to establish itself as something great I think it will always live in the shadow of that original one so I personally am going to give it three and a half out of five I think it's a perfectly innocuous good time but it's not anything spectacular and then next up, I have King Richard. And this is the biopic about Richard Williams, who is the father to Venus and Serena Williams. And I I just remember when they announced this movie, my very first thought was, why are we getting a biopic about the dad? He is, the fact that we are focusing on a man who happens to be the father, and he went, yes, coached to two of the greatest tennis players of all time, one of whom is probably the greatest tennis player of all time. Like, why focus on him? And after having seen the film and thinking about it, a part of me was like, since the two women are still currently living, you might not be able to get enough distance and you'd have to make the film about both of them. Or I'm sure one of them or both of them have been approached separately in order to do a biopic about themselves. And because the family seems so close knit, it, you know, they don't want that competition or whatever it may be. So I was like, all right, I guess telling a story about the father is an effective way to tell a story about the family as a whole. The film is two hours and 26 minutes. It could have been much, much shorter. Will Smith stars as Richard Williams. And I gotta say, actually, super huge credit to the girls who play Venus and Serena, Sanaya Sidney and Demi Singleton. They did such a great job as these, you know, remarkable young women. But I just, I think it's a perfectly fine film. I didn't 
really find myself connecting to it super hard. The parts I connected to the most were the parts about the girls. And yes, you know, I guess you can't really separate their rise to success from him because he is such an integral part of it. But there are so many more aspects of their careers and lives that extend beyond what the film covers that I wanted to know about. Like, I want to know about them as individuals as opposed to this man taking a lot of credit for who they are. And I'm, again, I'm sure credit is due to him, but they are the ones who actually have the talent and did the work. So it's like, uh, I just had sort of mixed feelings about this. And it left me wanting more about the girls. I also think, so the Williams were involved as executive producers. So this sort of has their seal of approval on it. But I think as a byproduct of that, you know, maybe it was too gentle with its portrayal of the father. You know, it seems like he may, he's an out there character. And it seems like uh, this is, you know, try, he's a flawed man and I don't know if it was willing to fully embrace those flaws in order to give us a good story because it's tough when you're telling a story about your father who, and by the way, is still living. So it's like, okay, well, but I think that unwillingness to really get into the nitty gritty, like there's one or two scenes where things start to traipse into that territory that I went, oh, there's more here than they are letting on, but then they just shy away from it and they go back to the like, you know, uh, pushing them to, to be better and, and focus on uh, having fun and all this stuff. And I also felt the film was... I just came off as really judgmental of anybody who doesn't live like a super straight and narrow path. The Williams family did not come from a super privileged background. And I get that the, you know, the odds were not in their favor circumstantially. And this is not explicitly touched upon in the film, but the family are Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, they, they talk about religion briefly, but they aren't explicit about the fact that, you know, being a Jehovah's Witness is a relatively restrictive thing. But I, you know, I just feel like it was like a zero tolerance film, right? Where if anyone would like, ooh, they talk about a thing that had happened in real life where, you know, a girl was caught with like marijuana and a, a white girl, by the way, um, a white tennis player. And it was like, ooh, Ooh, how dare she? Uh, terrible things, terrible things. And it's just like, almost part of me wants to be like, who are you to judge? Like, yes, the way that you brought up your girls was successful for them and kudos to you and all that stuff. But it's like other people have different paths and, you know, this is not the only way. We can't all be tennis prodigies. We can't all be whatever. So why are we criticizing other people? Like, just can we not live and let live? But I think it's a fine, pretty formulaic sports film. I just didn't get the feeling that I learned anything about the family that I hadn't already heard from interviews or things like that. But that's fine. Maybe that's not what you're looking for. So I think it's a perfectly innocuous, fine watch. It's available on HBO Max. I don't know if I would suggest going to a theater for this. I also know that it's probably going to get awards nominations, which I don't necessarily think it's deserving of. I think if it had been willing to show the character as even more imperfect because no human is perfect that maybe would have given Will Smith something to like really dig into but because it kept wanting to focus on the positivity factors and all that stuff I think it felt neutered in that way so I'm also going to give this 3.5 out of 5. And then the last film I have this week is called Tick Tick Boom. It is based on an autobiographical musical by Jonathan Larson. Jonathan Larson is the creator of Rent and it's directed by Lin-Manuel Miranda. This is his feature directorial debut and this is very very much a film for people who love musical theater and Broadway, much like how Ghostbusters is a film for people who love Ghostbusters. This is, I feel like, for people who already love musicals and that type of thing. You know, it is actually a musical as well, I should be clear. Andrew Garfield plays John, and then John is the character within Tick, Tick, Boom, who is basically Jonathan Larson. And a thing that confused me a little bit about Tick, Tick, Boom, and maybe this would have been easier if I was familiar with the actual play as opposed to having to piece together information based on having seen this and then, you know, reading about the the musical itself. So I think what this is, is a, an adaptation of the musical itself, but then it's sandwiched by this information on Jonathan Larson himself. So I'm like, oh, is this both a, a little bit of a, like a biopic bookends and then the actual play? And then it's confusing because the play slash musical is autobiogra semi-autobiographical. So the lines of like what's supposed to be the actual adaptation part and what is just sort of inserted into the storytelling to give us more context are a little blurred. And I found it actually a little bit off-putting because it starts out, and it's not a spoiler because it's the very beginning, but it starts out talking about who Jonathan Larson is as a person and you know it shows a little bit of uh, rent and all that stuff and it's like okay well if you were seeing just tick tick boom that wouldn't be in there I assume like I couldn't actually find the the script for the stage play version of it and then the other thing I would say about tick tick boom is that it got adapted the play version got adapted after Larson passed away because it used to be a one person show and then it's it's messy, I think is what I will say. And then the other thing about the film, you know, again, the film itself is a musical. So if you don't like musicals, 
this is absolutely not the one for you. Sometimes I'm like, oh, no, give it a chance. It's fine. This, I'm like, no, 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 no. If you don't already like musicals, this is not going to be your gateway into this. But the other thing is, and this is probably more of a criticism of the actual source material, I I did not find the character of John, you know, redeeming. And I'm going along this whole movie going like, are am I supposed to care about this character? And I feel like the problem is, because of the sort of meta-ness of the storytelling in the beginning, it's like you feel obligated to care about this character because you know they eventually have significance and cultural importance. But if I was just, to, like, if I didn't know who this person was, if I wasn't aware that they had written Rent, you know, all this stuff, and I didn't have that sort of precursor in the beginning, I'd be like, this dude's a jerk. Like, he's a self-centered jerk. And <laughs> why am I supposed to care about him? You know, like, where's the redemption? Where's the whatever? Where's the character development during it? I don't feel like I got that. I think Andrew Garfield does a fine job in portraying the character himself in that he, uh, you know, makes him semi-unlikable or selfish or whatever it is. And maybe maybe this is just me and maybe other people are like, oh my God, John's my favorite character. He's the best onstage character of all time. I don't get the sense that that's the case. I, don't, I hope people don't feel that about it or, or I'm just watching a very different show than the rest of everybody else. But the cast is rounded out by Alexander Shipp, who plays John's girlfriend, Susan, Robin DeJesus, who plays his friend, Michael. And then you've got Bradley Whitford as Stephen Sondheim, the musician slash Broadway legend, et cetera, et cetera. So the fact that this, it's just, it's, it's so inside baseball or inside Broadway or whatever it may be. There's one sequence where just so many cameos from Broadway stars show up and I was just like wow this is I mean I'm happy for them in that it's clearly like a fan moment you know like how Ghostbusters is fanning out about their own stuff this is fanning out about Broadway itself but I was like if you had no knowledge of this would you you'd be like, I mean again the singing is good so it's like okay whatever but I just the emotional beats weren't there for me. I found the characters, generally speaking, off-putting, and that may mean that they are successfully performing these roles, but I just felt like I was missing something the whole time because I wasn't familiar with some of the stuff they were talking about, right? So I, you know, I don't think this is meant for a wider audience, and that's totally fine. I think if you love Broadway and Broadway history and musicals and all that stuff, you're going to appreciate this film. I, As I said before, if you are not someone who's into that stuff, this is this is your kryptonite. This is absolutely not going to be the one for you. I will say in terms of adaptation from stage to screen, you know, that's something I've talked about a lot in terms of like, it does it make sense to put this on film? Did you take advantages of the medium of film or did you constrain it? And this could have just been a film stage show like let's say Hamilton was. You know, I, I think this does a pretty good job of showing us, you know, sets and locations and things like that. And, and there, there are a couple of creative sequences where you're like, ah, this was the flex. This is where a lot of the budget went. I get it. You know, they're, they're trying in a lot of moments. So I, I, you know, I respect that part of it, but I think it's fine. I think it's for a certain audience. I think the thing I was most surprised about that it's actually Andrew Garfield singing. He does a pretty decent job. As a mild Broadway fan, I somewhat enjoyed it. I think, again, if you are like a big Broadway fan, you're going to like this a lot more. And then anybody who's not, I say stay away from this. But I personally am going to give it 3.3 out of 5.